I want to talk to you about supernatural forces. And we'll do some experiments. One with uh, a gyroscope. Let's see what happens here. Now the gyroscope was spinning and standing up, but now it's fallen over and it's slowing down and I'm not doing anything to it. So whatever is slowing it down must be a natural force. Now the reason I want to talk about natural forces is because I talk to people about creation and evolution a lot. And when I ask people about evolution, if they have any scientific reason for believing in evolution, they really can't come up with anything because the scientific evidence is against the theory of evolution. But they usually say, well, I believe in evolution because the only other alternative is supernatural. And there are no supernatural forces. So let's do some experiments to see if there are supernatural forces or not. Now this gyroscope here is just spinning here naturally. Uh, it's been spinning for a minute and 13 seconds. And let's see what happens uh, as time goes on. Is this going to keep spinning forever? Or is it naturally going to come to a stop? Looks like it's slowing down. Yes, it definitely is slowing down. And it stopped. It stopped after 1 minute and 34 seconds. And that's natural. Now let's do another experiment. Reset the stopwatch here. And now let's see how long it's going to take for the gyroscope to start spinning and stand up all by itself. Um, I wonder how long we're going to have to wait for it to stand up by itself. You know, I don't think it's going to because it's natural for a gyroscope to stop spinning and fall down. But it is not natural for a gyroscope to start spinning and stand up. And really, there's only two kinds of forces in the world, natural and not natural. Uh, and the not natural ones would be supernatural. So if this thing started spinning all by itself, that would be proof that there are supernatural forces. But I don't think it's going to start spinning. So um, why don't you watch this for a little bit while I go and set up for another experiment and we'll see if that one can discover if there are supernatural forces at work in this world. Now, I should say that um, I'm not going to quote the Bible. I'm not going to tell you stories about angels or miraculous healings. I'm just going to use science. And let science tell us whether or not there are supernatural forces. Well, it looks like the gyroscope's not going to start spinning all by itself. So let's try another experiment. Here I have some red hot water. And it's red because I put red food coloring in it just to make the water easier to see. And I have some ice with some blue food coloring in it. And let's put the ice in the hot water and let's see what happens. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I should start timing this to see how long it takes. So, um, I'll bet you think that the blue ice is going to melt and dissolve and gee it's turning the uh, turning the water kind of purple because red and blue makes purple. Uh, now why is the ice melting? Well it has to do gee it's completely melted already. I didn't expect it to go that fast. 
That was just over, just over 30 seconds. Wow. Um, maybe I shouldn't have used such hot water because I wanted to talk longer. The reason the ice melted is because of something called the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy is never, neither created nor destroyed. Uh, but it does move from place to place. Now, at the beginning of the experiment, there was a lot of energy in the red hot water, which I had warmed up in a microwave oven. And so there was lots of energy in the water, and there was less energy in the ice cube that I had put in the refrigerator. And the second law of thermodynamics says that heat will flow from a hot place to a cold place naturally. And it will continue to flow until everything is the same temperature. So that's what's happened here. I put some ice in the, um, in the water and it melted. Now, we can do the same experiment that we did with the gyroscope and let's watch and see how long it will take for this glass of rather purplish water to separate back into red hot water and blue ice cube. Um, and I think you will agree that no matter how long we wait, it's not going to happen. If it did, that would be supernatural. It's natural for heat to flow from a hot place to a cold place. And it's not just heat that works this way. It works for all kinds of energy. Now, the reason why engineers like to talk about thermodynamics is because heat is like dollars. Um, there's lots of different kinds of money. There are pesos, there's dollars, there's euros, there's yuan, there's all kinds of different kind dollars, or diamonds and, and uh, silver and gold, all sorts of money. But if you want to make some sort of a transaction equally, the easiest way to do it is usually to convert uh, whatever kind of money into dollars and then figure out how many dollars is this diamond worth, worth, how much is this gold worth, so how much of this gold do I need to get the diamonds. In engineering, there's lots of different kinds of energy. There's potential energy, there's kinetic energy, there's nuclear energy, there's wind energy, there's solar energy, uh, but they can all be converted to an equivalent number of calories of heat. And no matter what form of energy you have, it's going to do, uh, obey the same laws of thermodynamics because in every case, the energy is going to be like heat flowing from a high energy place to a low energy place until both places are equal energy, just like the uh, heat flowed from the red water into the blue ice cube until they were both the same temperature. And, uh, yeah, a little warmer than room temperature, but, but it's all the same temperature. Uh, and that's what, um, that's natural. It is natural for energy to even out. And it would be supernatural if all of a sudden this uh, glass of purple water turned into red hot water and uh, blue ice. Now, there's another thing about the second law of thermodynamics, where, which is sometimes confusing, but it says that heat is going to go to a state of maximum disorder. Um, when we had water and ice, the heat was ordered in the water, and there was an order between the heat in the water and the lack of heat in the ice. And so it wanted to uh, even itself out. And the same thing is also true of the, uh, the dye. We have purple here because the red dye and the blue dye mixed together. They wanted to go from order to disorder. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, 
it's a little confusing because sometimes things that seem to be ordered are not. So let's do another experiment and show you how that works. Now this time, I'm going to put the blue ice in some hot yellow oil. And let's see what happens. Well, the ice sank down to the bottom, sort of. Now what we want to see here is will the yellow oil and the blue ice turn into a green mixture? Like the red water and the blue ice turned into purple water. Is this going to uh, turn into green water? And naturally it doesn't seem like that is happening. It seems like all of the blue water is on the bottom and the yellow is on top. And that's natural. Now let me stir it around a little bit. This will be unnatural. I'll do some unnatural stirring here. Mix it up if I can. And the water, the blue water, still seems to be going down to the bottom. But doesn't the second law of thermodynamics say that uh, things will tend to maximum disorder? Shouldn't the blue water and the yellow oil, shouldn't they completely mix? Now somebody who doesn't understand thermodynamics would say, see, this is an example of self-organization. Without doing anything, the oil organizes itself on the top and the water organizes itself on the bottom. But you see, that's a misunderstanding because the law of thermodynamics doesn't talk about visual appearance. It talks about energy. What's being disorganized is the heat. The water and the oil are turning to the same temperature, but the water is going to be down at the bottom because the water is heavier than the oil. And if you raise something up into a higher le energy level, it naturally wants to go down. So um, that might be kind of hard to see with the oil and water. So let's do it with a um, apple like Newton did. <clears throat> okay, now I have an apple. And I'm going to lift it up like this. And I'm going to let go. And what's going to happen? It fell down. Why did it fall down? Because this is a higher energy state than this. And according to the second law of thermodynamics, energy wants to flow from a high place to a low place until everything is at the same energy level. Now, energy can never be created or destroyed. So if there's energy up here, and less energy down here, where did the energy go? Well, when I dropped the apple, it made a sound. And that sound vibrated the air, and so the energy changed from potential energy to sound energy, which then dissipated just like the, uh, the heat in the red water dissipated into the cold blue ice. Energy always wants to uh, straighten itself out, or even itself out. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, I haven't said anything to this point that you probably didn't already know. But I needed to establish that because 
we want to talk about the difference between natural processes and supernatural processes. Now, this is a natural process, but now if I do this, whether the apple comes up instantly or slowly or through some sort of strange path rather than a straight path. Doesn't matter because potential energy is independent of path. It doesn't matter how quickly I raise the apple or what way I raise it. Okay, so here's the point of all these experiments. We want to know what's natural and what's supernatural. It is natural for an apple to fall from a branch and wind up on the ground. It would be supernatural for an apple on the ground to wind up on a branch on a tree. But you know that actually happens. An apple on the ground rots the seed inside the apple sprouts, turns into a trunk with some branches and leaves and a flower, and then it grows into an apple, and sure enough, you've got an apple moves from the ground up on a branch. Now granted, it's not the same apple, but still, how is it that this apple gets into a higher energy state. Now somebody would say, well, it's natural for apples to grow on trees. Well, it's not natural for an apple to grow on a dead apple tree. Now, what's the difference between a live apple tree and a dead apple tree? Is there something supernatural there? Because if, um, if you look at a leaf on a living apple tree, when you think about a leaf on a living tree or any green plant, the key word there is plant. Uh, in English, we refer to the place where they manufacture Ford mo automobiles as a Ford motor plant. A plant is something that makes something. Green plants make things. If you look at the leaf on an apple tree, it takes energy from the sun and it uh, uses that energy to break down carbon dioxide in the air into carbon and oxygen and it lets the oxygen escape. And it uses the energy from the sun to take water in up through the roots and it breaks the water down into hydrogen and oxygen, lets the oxygen escape, and then it takes the carbon and the hydrogen and puts them together into a long hydrocarbon molecule, maybe a sugar, maybe a fat, something like that. And in doing so, it creates a molecule that has more energy than just the component parts. And that's why when there's a forest fire, the, a lot of energy is released. It's hot when a tree burns because there's a lot of chemical energy stored in the tree, in the wood, in the sugar, in all those things. All that energy was stored there when the tree was alive. When the tree dies, when the leaf dies, uh, the leaf will turn brown, it'll fall to the ground, losing its potential energy. It lays there on the ground, it crumbles up, it, it, it disintegrates. And what happens is that the energy that was stored in the living plant goes back to uh, equilibrium so that energy is equalized all over the surroundings. Um, 
the difference between a dead apple tree and a live apple tree is that a live apple tree violates the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that naturally energy will tend to dissipate and equalize in, in, to the surroundings. But in a living tree, energy is um, concentrated in the fats and sugars and whatever else the, is in, in the apple and the bark and the trunk and the leaves. Uh, Sometimes you'll hear evolutionists say, well, the second law of thermodynamics doesn't hold because it's an open system. Well, a living apple tree appears to violate the second law of thermodynamics, uh, but it's not because energy is, is uh, shining on it. It's not because the sun is shining on it. Sun shines on a dead apple tree, too. And a dead apple tree does not produce apples. Uh, a dead apple tree obeys the second law of thermodynamics. But a living apple tree violates the second law by causing energy to flow from a cold place to a hot place. Uh, a living apple tree manufactures apples. It manufactures bark. It manufactures leaves. It takes energy and assembles it. So the, the way you can tell something dead from something alive is that something dead naturally obeys the second law of thermodynamics, but living things don't. Let's go back to the gyroscope. It's on the ground there, it's not moving, and now it is standing up and spinning. But the gyroscope isn't alive. How can that happen? That's not natural. We said before that when the gyroscope is just on the ground, not motion, motionless, it would be supernatural for it to start spinning again, and now it is spinning. Is that supernatural? Well, sort of. It's spinning because I spun it. Something living made this dead gyroscope disobey the second law of thermodynamics, at least for a little while. Now, if I keep spinning it, it will keep spinning, but since I'm not spinning it, it's naturally going to stop. Um, so, when something violates the second law of thermodynamics, it's evidence of some supernatural force. In this case, the fact that that's spinning is evidence that I must have spun it. You didn't have to see me spin it. You know, Just looking at it now, you know that I must have spun it. Because, naturally, that wouldn't happen. Now, the only reason why I could spin that is because I'm alive. When I'm dead, I will not be able to spin that gyroscope. So, supernatural force has to flow from somewhere to get supernatural things to happen. There must be some supernatural force that gives me life in order for me to get that gyroscope to spin. When you think about it scientifically, the fact that there are living things is proof that there must be a supernatural force. Natural laws cause things like this gyroscope to stop spinning or this apple to fall down to the ground. That's natural. For an apple to be created in the first place is not natural. It is supernatural. Now we don't call it supernatural because it's not a miracle, because it happens all the time. Uh, naturally, this, you know, sooner or later, if I don't eat it, this apple is going to rot and decay because it's not alive anymore. And since it's not alive, it obeys the second law of thermodynamics. So the fact that there is life proves that there are supernatural forces.